Uh, we're we're going to finish this year's, sounds daft saying that, only in March. We're going to finish this academic year's uh, worth of CEO sessions. It was the practicalities of how to, to actually set up a business. Uh, so we're going to go through the aspects of, of what you need to do uh, legally, what you need to do administra straight administratively uh, in order to actually get up and get started. I will though leave you or start, start you off with a little bit from uh, a few well-known celebrity entrepreneurs. I think if you've got a good idea, it's really important to be focused and not to let you know, negative people put you off. The piece of advice I give to someone about to start up is go for it. I do, I'm a great believer in people being brave enough to start new businesses and to really learn from that process. I know a lot of young people who've tried to start businesses and failed, but the amount they learned from it was terrific. And lo and behold, second time round, it looks like they'll succeed. So I think the biggest advice to anyone is really think about it, really work at it, and then be brave. Do something you feel passionate about, because if you feel passionate about it, you'll understand it, and you'll understand the rhythm of it, and you'll know whether it's good or bad. A lot of people come off the rails because they think that something's a good business idea, but it doesn't actually it doesn't actually motivate them as an idea except for the making of money. The, the, I have seen more failures through people being obsessed by the making of money than anything else. I've seen more successes with people passionate about an idea than anything else. Don't go into business unless you really absolutely love it to bits and are prepared to spend many, many years getting to grips with it. So love it. Secondly, be unbelievably honest about what's good and bad about your execution of that business. Be really, really honest. Don't blame other people, don't blame the market, don't blame the weather, don't blame anything. Just blame yourself and get to grips with it. And thirdly, have the tenacity to keep trying when it doesn't work. Go and ask people advice. People love giving you advice. It's unbelievable the number of chief executives, famous people, celebrities, you know, people you'd think were incredibly difficult, where if you ring them up and say, I'd like to ask your advice, you know, so people go, yeah, okay. So um, I'm a real believer in listening talk a bit myself as well but I'm a real believer in listening and just to soak it all in but the, the question I never ask anybody ever is should I do it because if they knew the answer they'd be out there doing it themselves so listen 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 and know that there's a filter system but some of the stuff coming in you know some of the especially the fear-based stuff it can never work you know it's their stuff you know it goes straight past some goes in the waste paper basket but you learn more from crit Somebody comes up to me and says, I had a really bad experience in Yo Sushi, which doesn't happen that often, but if that ever does happen, um, I, um, I learn far more from that, far more than people coming up and saying, great concept, really, really good. Um, I think if you think of starting a business, just follow a few steps, which is do your market research, convince yourself it's going to work raise money, implement your idea, and persist. So I've written a book called Anyone Could Do It, and in that there are all the sort of steps about how to start a business. You can get that nowadays. There are a lot of resources showing people how to start a business. So if you follow those steps, you're sort of okay, as long as you add that bit of hard work and persistence in there. Hi, great people. It's very hard to build a scalable business on your own. And when you're looking for those great people, look for people with different skill sets to yours, different ideas to yours. Otherwise, if you hire people who are just like you, your business is two-dimensional. Don't be surprised if you, it's not going to work straight away. You've got to have the tenacity, the courage and so on to probably go to hell and back before your idea will work because nothing's easy and certainly in business it certainly isn't. So. Some of those painted a rather nice picture, some of them painted quite an honest picture, some of them probably terrified you. But I think there's, there's two key aims or, or there's two key points to, to pick up from what they were saying. Firstly, as all the years I've spent being a business advisor is persistence has got to be the key thing if you're going to start a business. Things aren't going to be easy to start with, a lot of people alluded to that.
and it, you'll be very lucky if they are easy. But persistence. If you really don't, if you're really not doing something you're passionate about, and this was one of the people that alluded to this, you're going to give up. If you're into it for just money, you will give up when that money doesn't come in. If you're into it because you're passionate about the products or the service you want to make or deliver, then you will be able to persist more. The second thing is market research. Do your background before you do this. And we've, we've spoken before about market research and there is a bit now on, on YouTube that uh, the CEO have put on uh, of a previous session that we've done on, on market research. So there's lots to be learned just from those just from those very, very brief tips. In this country, and I stress in this country, so if you're planning to start up a business elsewhere, which one or two of you may be, then uh, it is slightly different. But in this country, you principally have four main options, taking away the not-for-profit businesses, which we're not going to focus too much upon today. Most of you will know what the top one is. Most of you will know what the bottom one is but whether you know about the, the, the two in the middle. Sole trader, freelance, uh, it's just the same thing, it's just the same person. Ideally, it's one of you going out designing and making. It's going out delivering consultancy on your own. It's a graphic designer that goes out to do contract work every now and again. Self-employed, sole trader, freelance, all exactly the same thing. And actually, the technical term is self-employed. But some of you will know it much more as, as a freelancer. So it's really easy to start up. In fact, you can do it now. And in theory, you could have been doing it for the last 11 months without necessarily being registered. So really easy to do. Uh, there's very little paperwork you have to literally just fill out one form on the uh, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs website, HMRC website, uh, and that's it, that's you going. There's no formal registration of your business, or in fact, there technically isn't a business. There is just you as an entity, you as a sole person doing some business type activity. So there is technically not a legal entity of a business. So there is no formal place to register it. Not like limited companies, which I'll, I'll touch upon in a minute. So there's very little registration, very little paperwork. The benefit, well, you get to keep all the profits, bar a little bit of tax and national insurance, which uh, you should obviously be paying. And you get to keep overall control. So if you want to steer the business one way, you can do. If you don't want to work with a particular client, you don't have to. If you don't want to work until neighbours in the afternoon, then don't work until neighbours in the afternoon. Get up when you want, work the way you want. You can do effectively what, whatever you want, as long as it's legal and moral. So you get to keep whatever control you want. The disadvantages, and this is where I scare you a little, is that you have unlimited liability, technically if you have no insurance. What I mean by that is if you go bankrupt, if the business goes bankrupt, so if you owe lots of money that you cannot repay, there is no difference between you as a, you as a business and you as a person. So they, they will try and recoup that money from you personally. There is also no difference in terms of legal status. So you, you, can be, you will be sued personally or in trouble personally rather than uh, in, in terms of a corporation or, or a company. Typically also the level of finance that's available to you is limited. So as a self-employed person, for those of you who have seen Dragon's Den, and if you have you'll, you'll be familiar with some of the faces on there, for those of you who've seen Dragon's Den, a lot of people will say, here's 30% of my business if you give me £50,000. Well, Technically, you can't do that if you're self-employed because there are no shares in the business to give away. It is just you. So you cannot, you cannot raise money through what's known as equity sale. You can only raise money by taking grants, taking loans, uh, the three Fs, family, friends and fools. Uh, 
you cannot sell equity in a business like you would imagine in, in Dragon's Den. And for a lot of businesses, a lot of businesses won't deal with you unless you're a limited company. There is a, a certain amount of prestige about being a limited company. There is a certain amount of seriousness that a limited, being a limited company confers. It also makes you look larger than you actually are if you're a limited company. One person can technically set up a limited company, but one person can also set up a, a self in, a sol, as a sole trader or self-employed. One looks considerably bigger than the other one because you can hide the one person status behind a limited company. You can't hide it if you're a sole trader. So there are lots of organisations that typically won't deal with you if you're just a sole trader. So just bear that in mind and, and how you set up your business will be crucial to how it succeeds in later, later life. You can start as self-employed and then progress up to becoming a limited company. That's not a problem. What you can't do is go from a limited company to sole trader. So just bear in mind your starting point. So technically you're classed as uh, self-employed if you're free to hire other people uh, on the terms to do the work you've taken on. So you can take on what's known as associate consultants or other people uh, within without actually paying, without employing them. You have to hire them in. So they will be freelancers working for you. You risk your own money in the business. And this one's an interesting one and is one reason why uh, DMU staff have to seek permission uh, to do any uh, self-employment work because technically by law you have to provide the main items of equipment needed to do the job. So if you're here using uh, DMU resources, DMU might have a problem with that. And, and technically, and again uh, under law, you have to work for a number of different organisations. If you're just a sole trader working, for example, for DMU, then technically DMU should take you on as an employee. Uh, so you must show that you're not just working for one client. Okay, at the start, then you're allowed to build that up. But if you continually work for just one client, then question marks will be asked. The easiest thing, the, the best thing about being self-employed is, depending on your contract, if you, if you are, have got a... Uh, a, a job is that you can be self-employed and employed at the same time. So if you've got a part-time job or if you've got a full-time job, then there is nothing wrong with you having a self-employment status as well. Uh, it's just a little bit more, slightly more complicated with your tax form. That's all it is. And in fact, uh, high earners, those earning over the, whatever the threshold uh, George Osborne will make it now, around 41,000. If you earn over 41,000 pounds and you have children, you are technically self-employed because you have to file a self-employed tax return because of the aspects of child tax, uh, uh, sorry, child benefit. Minor point, not one for you to worry about in the immediate future by the looks of you. So you can be self-employed and work full-time at the same time. What happens if you don't then want to go it alone? If one or two of you want to join up and work under the auspices of, of one organisation? Well, that's what a partnership's for. Again, really quite basic. Uh, it's a flexible structure, so you and your partner or you and your partners, uh, it, can just be, it can be more than just one. Uh, can set up how you run the business, in inverted commas, as much as you want. You can be really flexible. There is, again, very little paperwork. There are two forms, rather than just one. Uh, if you're setting up as a partnership, each partner will have to register as a self-employed person with HMRC. And then one of the partners takes it upon themselves to be a lead partner who completes then a partnership form. And that's it. So there is very little else extra to do other than the fact that you have to uh, 
do one extra form of being a partnership. Uh, for those of you who are interested in, in the actual corporate aspects of this, one advantage of a partnership is that you cannot be taken over aggressively by any other business. What I mean by that is, again, you cannot sell shares in the business. So one partner can't sell a certain amount of shares in their business, which then forces a takeover. Uh, so for the football fans in this, in this uh, there are all sorts of, uh, all sorts of cases where uh, aggressive boardroom takeovers, takeovers have happened in football clubs, forcing people out. Uh, and in fact, Sahara Shimi, uh, you saw her on the, on the film, uh, uh, her, her time at Coffee Republic, which is the business she first started, uh, she was forcibly taken out, uh, forcibly bought out of her business. You cannot do that with partnerships. So it's, it's a little bit protected. You again have unlimited liability. There is no separate entity still between you as a partnership and you as a company. There is technically, again, no company. It is just two or three of you working together as two or three sole traders. So the other thing is that you're all responsible for each other's negligence. So if one person does something wrong, all to, or everyone gets in trouble for it. So there has to be a certain degree of trust. There has to be a certain degree of responsibility. Otherwise, you get the last one. Which in my experience as a business advisor is probably the sole reason most partnerships fail. Because of disagreements within partners. So one partner wants to take the business that way, the other partner wants to take it that way, and you can't find a happy medium. It's a bit like a band. One band member wants to take it in a certain direction, another band member takes it in a different direction, and all of a sudden the band's split up. That's exactly the same as a partnership, and, off, and more often than not happens. In that instance, and one thing that we would always say as an advisor, is consider a partnership agreement. So whilst there's no paper, or very little paperwork, and it's a very flexible structure, consider a partnership agreement in law. So you ask a solicitor to create you a partnership agreement. What that will do is lay down what happens in, the, in, in, a, in a problem. So who owns what, who gets what share of the business, who does what within the business. You don't have to split a partnership 50-50. If it's decided between the partners that one partner is going to do more than another, then you can split it 75-25, whatever it might be. But to get a full protection and understanding of that, get a partnership agreement done. It's a bit like a prenuptial in marriage. So if you're going to start out, lay down what you're going to do to start with. It will then help you if things go wrong. Uh, as, a, as a very open and honest uh, anecdote, I started a partnership a few years ago uh, with, at the time, my best friend. We did exactly that. One, one partner went that way, I went that way, and I haven't spoken to him since. So it can get pretty nasty sometimes. Uh, we sold the business, we did, it, we did rather well, but uh, it, we still haven't spoken to each other. Taking partnerships that little bit more seriously. Uh, and this is the sort of format you'll typically find in professional services organisations. So legal, accountancy, uh, architecture. You'll often see LLP against, uh, against, at the end of their name. And all that means is that they're a limited liability partnership. So they've taken the partnership structure and protected it a little bit they've limited their liability. So instead of saying there is unlimited liability on me personally, they're limiting the liability to the company that they form. So they formally form a company that's registered with Companies House. And then instead of having a managing director and a board of directors, they have a level of partners that run the organisation which is again why you'll often see the, uh, the job title partner or, or, par or senior partner in a solicitor or an accountant's firm because they typically have partners rather than directors. 
it provides, it, it limits your own personal responsibility. So it's a really good model if you're worried about the aspects of litigation, of the legal aspects, or worried about the financial aspects. Uh, it also allows you to share up formally your management responsibilities. So a little bit more serious. Uh, in terms of the disadvantages, well, there's an actual cost to form the company. So for sole traders, if you want to go self-employed, if you want to form a partnership, there is, no te there is technically no cost to starting. And you could have started 11 months ago. For an LLP, you cannot start that till it's formally registered. You've gone through the process of, of spending the money to actually form the company and start it. So it's a little bit more of a bind at the start. You have to provide audited and publicly disclosed accounts. Although if you are pretty small, uh, which some of you may be to start with, uh, then you are exempt to a certain degree. Uh, the issue with publicly disclosed accounts, well, everyone can see how well or how, how badly you're doing. Technically, anyone uh, in this country can pay to see the company accounts of any limited com company in this, in this country. And in fact, uh, a lot of them are on free library databases called FAME. Uh, if you want to look up how well a company is doing, just go on to FAME. Uh, and uh, you can search their name and you'll get their company accounts. It doesn't make brilliant reading, uh, and in fact, if you've got insomnia, I would recommend you read company accounts because they do tend to send you asleep. Uh, but you can see it, uh, and that is a disadvantage. So your rivals can see how well you're doing or how badly you're doing. It is a little bit more complicated. You do have to go through a formal formation. There are people that will form... A, form there are people that will form a business for you. So there are, if, if you Google company formation agents, they can do it all for you, but they'll do it for a fee. And that fee is usually pretty small. If you try to do it yourself, it, it's more likely to be uh, a little bit more expensive. More expensive, 500 pounds plus to form a company. A company formation agent will probably do it in the region of 100 to 150. Uh, so you're often taxed as self-employed, although there are some exemptions. A legal document, this time you have to do it. A legal document uh, should be drawn up between the parties detailing distribution of profits, as we've discussed as, a, as the lower partnership. Uh, the responsibilities, so what each partner will formally do, uh, and how the LLP will actually run, how the limited liability partnership will actually operate. Now... The final one, the final one of four, uh, there are many more, uh, but the, the, the usual four are these, uh, is the typical business. That's very much how you'll know most businesses in, in this country, most uh, the typical businesses. There are some that are known as a public limited company or a PLC. That just means they're floated on the stock exchange in one way, shape or form generally either AIM or uh, the FTSE 100. Uh, but these, you retire, you, uh, these are not public companies, these are uh, limited companies. And you, have, <coughs> you are separating the liability formally. A bit like a partnership, but actually now you're, you're starting a company, what you would traditionally know as a company. So you're setting yourselves up as directors. This is when you can call yourself a director. You have limited liability. So they, they cannot do anything other than go after the company. So whatever the company's worth, if you go bust, that's all they can go after. They can't go after anything else in order to get the money back. You also have a separate legal identity. So you are a company rather than a person. So any, any issues with legality, again, they refer, to, they, they refer to the company rather than you as an individual. You can, as I've said, raise finance by, uh, going to, uh, by selling shares of the business in the traditional kind of dragon's den way. So if you know of a, a, one of the three Fs, perhaps a fool that wants to invest in your business, 
you can say, well, I'll give you 10% if you want to invest. doesn't mean they'll ever get that money back, uh, but they will own 10% of your business. So you'll have seen a lot of this in, in, in the kind of public domain, whereby people buy uh, shares in companies, people buy uh, stakes in a company. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the WhatsApp, you, you, uh, some of you may have heard of the story where Facebook bought WhatsApp for an absolute obscene amount of money. Well, half of that money was going to be paid for in shares of Facebook. So <coughs> those people that owned WhatsApp were not just receiving the cash in their pocket, they were also receiving shares in Facebook. So Facebook, in essence, have raised finance for the sale of WhatsApp by giving what the WhatsApp people shares in Facebook. You can't do that if you're a sole trader. You can't do that if you're a partner. You can only do that if you're a limited company. Disadvantages, well, again, there's a cost to start the company, and that cost is very, very similar to an LLP. You have to go through either a company formation agent or you do it yourself through a solicitor. So again, you're talking about 100, 120 pounds, very much north of 500 if you want a solicitor to do it. There is a whole host of legislation that you have to uh, abide by, as there is really for you to trade in any, in any shape or form. So you have to be aware of the specific legislation that's, that's relevant to your business. Uh, so there, there are all sorts of things, like the Distance Selling Act. Uh, so if you're selling over the web, you need to be aware of the Distance Selling Act. Those sorts of things. And again, you have to disclose your accounts. You have to pay to have them audited. A chartered accountant needs to sign off your uh, accounts every six months. So there's a payment to do that. So there is a cost. So a limited company will give you that great protection, but there's a cost to that protection. There is another option, and uh, there are lots, and you'll be surprised about what is a fran franchise and what isn't. Uh, you all know what a franchise is? It's when you pay X amount of money uh, to, to basically start a business, but that business is already there for you. Anyone know a, a, a franchise company? Subway. Subway, that's a great example. Yeah, it costs about 20, used to cost about £20,000 to buy a Subway, to buy the Subway franchise. So you have to set it all up, but you know, £20,000 and then a profit share as well. So there's usually a, a quite a high cost to buy into the franchise, but then you can run the business. You'll have a lot of procedures to run the business, but you usually can run the business. You often have to also pay royalties on sales. So there's a flat fee at the start, and then there's a royalty fee ongoing. Gives you a little bit of protection, because the franchise or the person that you've bought the franchise from, or the company you've bought the franchise from, will often give you a lot of guidance. In fact, anyone know that McDonald's is a franchise? or certain aspects of McDonald's as a franchise. And their franchise manual is about yay thick. And this is instructions on how to run the business, how to run the McDonald's franchise. And that even goes to the way that you mop the floor. McDonald's are giving you instruction on how you mop the floor. You should mop the floor like that, not like that. That's the kind of support you get for a franchise sometimes. You still need to register formally, probably as a limited company in this case, although uh, some you can get away with doing self-employed, depending again what the nature of the franchise is. Uh, but it allows you to set up a business to be a manager of a business without necessarily having to start from scratch. So it can be quite a good model for some, especially if you see an obvious opportunity. And again, you'll be surprised as to what is uh, a franchise. You know the, the, the Leicester City Football Club? There's a uh, hotel next to it, Holiday Inn Express. Holiday Inn Express is a franchise. That quite surprised me when I found out. Uh, the not-for-profits. Now, there are all sorts of different, uh, 
different types of not-for-profit organisations. So what we would typically term as either a social enterprise or a charity. And I'm not going to go into very much detail about them. Typically, though, they do not aim to make a profit, really. A profit that you can draw out. What they do is aim to make a contribution to central costs, uh, as it's commonly termed, in order that they can recycle the money on new projects or recycle the money back into the community or providing extra services. They're accountable to wider members uh, and their, their, uh, their community. So the co-op, the co-op as a shop, as an organisation, is one of these. So they, they are uh, accountable to their members and accountable to the communities which they serve. And you'll often see uh, AGM's membership meetings to the co-op. There are all sorts of different structures. Uh, that's probably one of the most widely used one, a CIC, Community Interest Company. Uh, you'll all have heard of that one. Various different forms provide various different levels of protection uh, and various different uh, issues surrounding them in terms of the administrative burden uh, or the, uh, the, the, the hurdles you have to go, for, go through. If you're interested in a social enterprise, I would recommend you, you speak to a social enterprise, uh, uh, more, more of a social enterprise professional. And there are lots of, lots of agencies out there to support social enterprises. Unlimited being the, uh, being the most obvious one, which is uh, UN Limited. All one word. The local one as well, yes. Yes, very possibly. Uh, so if you are interested in doing it, speak to CEO and they'll give you the, uh, the local contact details. So we've, we've, we've gone through the majority of the actual technical hurdles that you all need to do. You all need to go over. And the last few are now are just bits of advice, really, as an advisor. And some of them will echo what, they, uh, what the professionals have said, what the celebrity on entrepreneurs have said. I would always recommend that you write a business plan. Now, business plans are, go from really, really burdensome, detailed documents to those that are a couple of pages thick, a couple of pages long. And it would really depend on the, the, the reason you are writing a business plan as to what format you give it. If you want to raise finance, if you want a loan, if you want a, 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 a loan from the bank or a grant from a public sector organisation, you will probably have to write a business plan. If you don't want any of that and you just want to set it up on your own with the cash that you've got and you're quite happy uh, going along as a, what we class as a lifestyle business, I would still recommend you produce a business plan. The reason for doing so is it allows you to focus your ideas. Probably as creative people in this room, most entrepreneurs or business owners are, you'll have lots of ideas floating around in your head. And the only way to get them out of your head is to write them down. And in essence, a business plan will help you to do that. It will help you to get them from your head onto paper and make them reality. Whether it's a formal structure of a business plan or not, get it down on paper because that will help you develop it. That will help you form a direction for the idea. For some of you, I strongly recommend you don't do a formal business plan. You just do basically an ideas plan how you plan to move your idea into reality. So let's, let's just re-term it. Because a business plan will just turn you off to business. And that's not what I'm here to do. Technically then, it's a live document. Uh, you generally have to write a business plan uh, at some point in your career, probably. I have to write them annually uh, and for every project I, I start. Uh, it's a live document that will help you provide direction, and you should change it as the business changes, as the environment changes. Most people will start a business, and it will start here, and it will go to there, and it will come back, and 
It will change direction all the time. But I guarantee for every one of you in this room, if you're going to start that business, it will be very much more different in a year's time or two years' time than you originally start with now. Because that's business. That's what happens. Your ideas change. The, the market tastes change. So a business plan shouldn't just be something you do and put in a drawer somewhere. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. The other thing of a business plan, the other advantage, is it allows you to spot pitfalls before they may happen. So particularly on the financial situation, on the finances of the business. And, and actually, most businesses nowadays fail for not having enough cash in the business. A lot of the high-profile ones have got cash. They've got loads of assets, they've got lots of shops, they've got lots of stock, but they haven't got enough money, typically, to pay the taxman. So Rangers Football Club being one of them. So think about writing a business plan if you're going to do lots of financial transactions because that will allow you to spot any financial issues before they happen and it will allow you to do something about them before they happen. Now, the second one comes from a marketeer and I'm very much more a marketing specialist uh, it, within my business advice. So, I would hope you all have some sort of idea about how, you how you're going to communicate your business or your business idea to the outside world. If you don't tell people about it, no one's going to know about it. And if no one's going to know about it, then no one's going to buy anything from you. The key thing to do is to get your message out there. So we need to have an idea as to what that message is going to be and how we're going to communicate it to people. And that's all a marketing plan needs to be. Just an idea about the key messages you want to create, the timescales that you're going to do, the types of media, the types of method that you're going to use to get your message out there, and the messages you, you create. Marketing is one of the most expensive things for business, for any business. Get it right. Uh, choosing the right name. Choosing the right name can really help you stand out from the crowd. Uh, and technically, uh, if you're starting in a partnership, or in fact, even if you're a sole trader, you can trade under a name. Sole traders do not have to trade under their own name. That's an important thing to remember. So choosing, your, choosing a name can help you really stand out. And in fact, there are a whole host of, of new names that are coming out. Names that don't seem to make any sense whatsoever. Things like Huddle. Well, Huddle would be H-U-D-D-L-E, if my spelling's correct. But actually, no, Tesco have created Huddle, H-U-D-L. And then there's Flickr and all those sorts of new internet names. They, help, they, they stick in your mind. They're spelled completely incorrectly. Uh, and, and it really riles me somewhat that all of a sudden they can create these new words out of nothing, but they stick in your mind. So be creative. Think about how a name will help you stand out from the crowd, which is typically where I get shouted down from uh, the particularly the designers. And I would strongly say that if you're a new designer, please don't use your own name. Why? Because, okay, Ralph Lauren does, Tommy Hilfiger does, all of those big name designers do it but they've spent years and years and years gaining reputation in order to, that they can use their own name. You guys haven't yet, but if you do, then great, use your own name. George did, George Davis from Next. He spent years and years and years building up his reputation as lead designer at Next, and now he's got his own label. Okay, it's with Asda, but he's got his own label. But he wouldn't have done that unless he knew that he would have the reputation, the awareness to do so. So even if you're a designer, I would strongly recommend do not use your own name. It doesn't create any interest whatsoever in your business. Uh, there are a couple of things you cannot do, uh, uh, you must do. So if you're, a, uh, a, a red, if you're planning to set up a limited business, then you must register it formally with Companies House, and you must register the name formally as Companies House. 
and it must not be the same name as any other business currently existing at the moment. Uh, otherwise, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's potentially an issue of something called passing off, uh, which is an aspect of law. Uh, for those of you a bit geeky about pop, uh, a few years ago there was a, a band called... Uh, oh, gosh, I've forgotten it now. It'll come to me. Forget it. Liberty X. Liberty X didn't start off being Liberty X. They started off being Liberty. But there was a band in Australia that were called Liberty, so they questioned it. And they had to add the X. There you go. Bit of rubbish trivia for you. But relates to my point. Uh, so it must not be the same name as any other business. And ideally, if you're setting up as a partnership or a sole trader, please also do those checks. Uh, there are certain things that you can't use, royal in particular, unless you're a purveyor to the Queen uh, or, or the royal household, an institute, universities particularly like that one. So you cannot use that. You cannot use uh, names that will, will take offence. So uh, FC UK have got into a few bits of trouble uh, with their, uh, some of their T-shirt slogans, assuming to take offence. Uh, and there was a case in America... Uh, where, where a, a company called Sofa King uh, uh, was, uh, was, was around and they rang the tagline, Sofa King Low Prices. Uh, so they got themselves into a mild bit of trouble with that one as well. Uh, little hint, uh, and where a lot of these new internet names are coming from is because they cannot get the URLs, they cannot get the domain, domain names for, uh, for usual words. So please check the domain name is available for your business when you start it up. You technically have to open a business bank account, again, whether you're a sole trader or, or a limited company. So there are things to think about. Always get comparison on terms. Just shop around, please. Think about the, 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 the package that they're going to offer you. Most banks will give you free business banking for a period of time for a new start business. Most banks will also give you a certain degree of free business banking if you only plan to, to bank online. If you pay in cash a lot, they, they will charge you for it. Uh, so think about that. If you're planning to trade internationally, think about that. Uh, there are good banks and bad banks if you're planning to trade internationally. HSBC is a particularly good one. Uh, allocation of, their bank, of your bank manager, that's really important. If you need to talk to your bank manager at the moment, some banks, it's really, really hard to get hold of. They cover a really wide area uh, and their availability is awful. Uh, but that will become really useful uh, if you're in any, any sorts of problems uh, with your business. So think about it. You've probably heard things about VAT. There is no legal necessity to, to enter into VAT unless you turn over uh, what at the time is £79,000 or more. Uh, you can voluntarily uh, register for VAT, and that's particularly good if you're buying in a lot of products that are VATable, uh, because then you can reclaim the VAT back. Consider aspects of insurance, and there are three there to consider. Uh, public liability uh, protects you against uh, damage to anyone entering your shop, for instance. So if anyone hurts themselves in your shop, that's where public liability comes in. If you're making something and anyone hurts themselves with those products, product liability is good. And if you're doing things that I do in terms of consultancy, then a professional indemnity is vital. Consider aspects of health and safety, although the health and safety laws are changing rapidly to make, small biz to make it easier for small businesses. And as I've said now, uh, as I've said already, learn the specific legislation to your business. As a generic business advisor, I cannot know the specific legislation surrounding every last business idea. So it is your responsibility to know that and your responsibility to deal with that. So to summarise, choose the right type of, for, uh, of format for your business. Uh, it's good to, to make a good start with that. Do the necessary registration process. And for most of you, it is much, much, much easier than I have probably made it out to be today, and much easier, certainly, than you think it is. Uh, be aware of the legislation, as I've just said. 
and choose the right name for your business. It can really, really, really help it. And the last thing I would say is plan. But mostly, do your market research. Market research cannot be underestimated when you start a business. That's all for me today.